Thanks for joining us at Dream City Online. Stay connected by downloading the Dream City Omaha app. And don't forget to subscribe for all our latest videos. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? How many of you are thankful for the sun that finally, my goodness, I saw something this week that said that we hadn't seen the sun since Monday at like 9 a.m. or something like that, that it had been cloudy for the last five days. And then finally yesterday, it, it peeked through and, uh, and I'm so grateful for it. Anybody else just feel just to have a lack of energy this week? And just like, oh, and then finally the sun came out, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Today, uh, Luke chapter 17, if you have your Bibles and you want to read along. Before we, before we get there, though, uh, how many of you guys have, have ever, you've been downtown in Omaha. There's a couple like Omaha institutions. Uh, one is the, the guy that used to go around selling roses downtown. Anybody ever run into him? While you were downtown going to restaurants or walking around. The other one is the balloon lady. How I many of you guys know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Omaha balloon lady? She'll come into to different restaurants downtown and she's got her balloons on her side and she'll go to all the tables with kids and she'll ask them if they want a balloon animal. Right, we were, we were down there with the Pirtles a few weeks ago and the girls wanted a, a, a balloon this or, or different things. And so she blows up the balloons and she makes little things out of the balloons and then she hands them back to you and she's like, that'll be $15. And it's like, that balloon was 10 cents. How was it $15? I remember I was down there one time and I, I, had, this, I had this balloon animal made. She, she made this balloon elephant and there's this huge elephant. And after dinner, we were going back out to the car and was going to the car and, and opened the door and was trying to get this balloon elephant in the car, but I couldn't fit. It wouldn't fit in the car, so I had to pop the trunk. There you go. You're welcome. Some of you that you've been waiting for a decent joke, there it was. And some of you are sitting there like, I don't get it. I had to pop the trunk of the elephant to get a fit. Okay. Somebody else will explain it to you later. <laughs> Every week we start with a joke because laughter prepares the brain for learning. So we just want to put you in a situation where, where you're most apt to learn something today. We've been going through our reading plan. We, we started at the beginning of the year. Those of you that haven't been joining with us would encourage you to join. Uh, we read one chapter from the New Testament for five days. And then there's two days where, where you have off, either to catch up on days that you missed or to spend time dedicated to memorization because we're reading five chapters a day and then memorizing two verses. And by the end of the year, we will have memorized the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And so the memorization for this week, uh, Matthew chapter 5, said, blessed are who? Who's the first one? Blessed are the merciful. This week's memorization, those of you that remember, blessed are the merciful. Why? They will be shown mercy. And then blessed are who? Pure in heart. And why are they blessed? They will see God. We're almost done with the Beatitudes. This week coming up will be the last of the Beatitudes, and we'll get into the rest of the sermon. Uh, but just want to encourage you in your memorization. The Bible says, that word, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so if you want to, to strengthen your faith this year, if you want to be gritty this year, if you want this to be your best year, if 23 was a, a struggle and you're, you're looking for more in 2024, would encourage you to take God's word and plant it deep within your heart. It doesn't mean that everything around you is going to be perfect, but it means that God will give you the grace and the strength to, to persevere and to push through and he'll, his grace will be made known in your life. So I want to encourage you in that. This week we read Luke chapter 16 through 20. And as we read Luke 16 through 20, we, we see that Jesus has been traveling around the countryside and he's, he's preaching and he's teaching, he's doing miracles. Um, but the Bible says that, that he begins to make his way back to Jerusalem. Does anybody know why he's coming back to Jerusalem and why the Bible specifically points this fact out? Why is Jesus coming back to Jerusalem? For the Passover. Everyone would come to, to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now what is... What is, what is different about this coming Passover? He will be arrested. He will be tried. He will be crucified. For those of you that maybe, maybe aren't familiar with the story, spoiler alert, in our reading this week, we will see Jesus betrayed by one of his best friends and sold out for 30 pieces of silver. We will see him confronted and arrested and brought up on, on really bogus charges. He stands trial and is convicted and, and he's crucified. 
He's hanging in the middle of, of these, these two thieves. And yet that's not the end of the story because in Luke chapter 24 this week, we will see Jesus resurrected and God's power displayed in, in such a miraculous way that three days he spends in the tomb and on that third morning, he, he gets up. And so if you haven't read the story, there's your spoiler. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you ruined it for me. <laughs> Could you imagine not having known this story? Like, it's something that we all take for granted, right? We, we come to church, even if we come to church only on Easter, we hear that story every year, every Easter. But imagine you had no context for that. Imagine you just pick up a Bible one day and you start reading about this humble man who begins to love people and have compassion on people and is sent by God to bring about God's will and God's kingdom here on earth. And so he's empowered to do these miraculous things. And he, he feeds thousands of people with just a, a value menu item from Long John Silvers. And he, he heals the blind and he, he raises the dead and he calls Lazarus forth from the grave. And you start reading this and, and he's, he's taking care of those that society has cast aside. And the ones that nobody cares about are the ones that his heart breaks for. This incredible man, everyone loves him. And then imagine getting to the end of one of the gospels and seeing him betrayed and crucified and killed and hung there so that your sin could be forgiven. Like, could you imagine, like, what are these people thinking? Like, you want to talk about a plot twist. Why am I saying it? Because I don't want you, as you read through the gospels, as you read through the New Testament, don't just take it for granted because you've read it before. Well, I know this story. I've heard this parable. I know what's going to happen. Listen, read it as if you didn't. And ask the Holy Spirit to, to reveal and bring revelation in your life. And so we, we've read this week, he's traveling. And, and in Luke chapter 17, he encounters these, these 10 lepers, the Bible says. We're going to begin reading in verse number 11 of chapter 17. If you didn't bring your Bible, the verse will be on the screens for you. Here's what it says. that as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village there, 10 lepers stood at a distance, crying out, please answer your phone. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what they cried out. <laughs> love you, whoever that was. I love you. He entered a village there and 10 lepers stood at a distance and they cried out, what? Jesus, but not just Jesus, Master. It's very easy for us to come to church and to cry out Jesus, but very few of us want to cry out Lord. So master, master is Lord. Lord is master. Be the director of my life. Like Angel said, he is the boss of you. It's not just Jesus, my savior, but they cried Jesus, my master, Jesus, my Lord. They said, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. Sounds interesting. Not sure why that was the command. We'll look at that here in a few minutes. But as they went, the Bible says they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, did not heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And Jesus says to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Lord, I thank you for your word today. God, I thank you that, that even as these men thousands of years ago cried out, Jesus, master, have mercy, that they found mercy. And we thank you that today, Lord, there is mercy for us to be found. We thank you, Lord, that as we, we contemplate and as we think about your mercy and our need for mercy, Lord, I thank you that your mercies are new every day. They're new every morning. They never run out. And so, Lord, for, for those of us that need mercy today, I thank you that we can come boldly before your throne and ask and be met with mercy and met with grace in our time of need. Lord, I pray that your word would come alive in our hearts, that we would apply it and allow it to be transformational. Holy Spirit, have your way as daily you transform us into the image of the Son. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. How many of you have ever needed mercy? Come on. Half of you are, are humble enough to, to admit it. The other half, either too lazy, too tired, or too stubborn to raise your hand this morning. But 
But we've all been there, right? Whether you walk into class and the assignment was due and you didn't do it. And so you go to the teacher and you ask, can I, can I have one more day? Do you accept late work? Can I get partial credit? Come on, you, you're driving down the interstate and you see those, those lights flashing behind you and the officer walks up to the window and you roll it down. What do you, what do you ask for? Can I just get a warning? Is there any way you could give me a warning? How fast did you clock me at? Oh, my speedometer must be broken because I could have swore I was going 10 miles an hour less than that. Are you sure it wasn't the car next to me, but you're asking for what? For, for mercy. So many times in our lives, we, we are confronted with a situation where we just need mercy. Here we see 10 men who encounter Jesus and they, they don't just ask for mercy because when you need mercy, it's not like, excuse me, sir, can I have mercy? And they, if you need mercy, you need mercy. You don't care what you look like. You don't care who, who, who's around you. You don't care what anybody else sees. If you truly need mercy, you will do whatever you need to do to find mercy in that situation. I think, of, I, think of, I think of Braveheart when I think about mercy. I think about crying out for mercy, right? William Wallace, come on, you know what I'm talking about. At the end of that movie, he's being tortured and he's rebelled against England, against the crown. And so at the end of the movie, he's laying there and, and the man says, if you, if you would just kiss the emblem on my robe and cry mercy, it will all be over soon, right? You guys remember that scene? The movie's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be about William Wallace and his life, but I swear that scene was based on my childhood. And, and not, that, not that like my parents ever, you know, it's not like my dad was ever like kiss the ring and cry for mercy. But I remember, listen, I remember one time in particular, I remember that we had just gotten this new set of white furniture. We were still young. Now, listen, what my parents were thinking, getting white furniture with three little kids at home, I don't know. Thank God he has, he has increased their wisdom in their years. But they got this set of white cloth furniture. And so the rule, of course, no food, no drinks, nothing on the couch. Well, I thought it would be a good idea to take my red Kool-Aid in and sit on the couch. And it probably wasn't even my fault. Like Jordan probably bumped me or something. Like it was probably her fault. But I remember spilling this cup of red Kool-Aid on this new white couch, and I ran to my room and just was crying, mercy, right? I wasn't crying for mercy, but that's what I needed. I needed mercy, and my mom was standing there with the belt. <laughs> if you would just cry mercy, it will all be over soon, right? Like, I felt, I felt like I could empathize with William Wallace in that moment. But no, she was quick to remind me today, do you remember what I said to you as you were crying in your room? I said, no, that's all blocked out. Like I've, she said, I told you, John, I love you more than that furniture and I care more about you than that furniture and it's okay. It's like, are you sure you said that? <laughs> but when you truly need mercy, Right? You're not worried about who's around or, or what you're going to look like. And that was where these men were. They needed mercy. Maybe, maybe it wasn't you know, a situation like that, but maybe, maybe just you having an encounter with Jesus and finding out about you know, the state of your sinfulness compared to his righteousness and how that there's this, this eternal hope that can be found and there's this place that Jesus has been preparing for us that, you know, he told his disciples, in my father's house are many rooms and, and I go there to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. But the problem is uh, there's no sin allowed there. Now we're confronted with the reality of our sinfulness and God's holiness and, and there is this gap that must be bridged. And yet God in his mercy, First Peter tells us, because of God's great mercy, he's made it possible for us to be born again, to have this new life, to be washed, to be cleansed for, for our sin, the payment to be taken care of by Jesus. And when we stand before God, rather than being covered in our sin, we can be clothed with his righteousness. That's the hope that we find. And, and maybe for you, mercy, you think of mercy and you think of it 
You think of it that way. Today, as we contemplate, as we think about and discuss the mercy of God, there are four really simple truths that I want to point out to you. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write these down. If you're not taking notes, I would encourage you to take notes. Here's the, the first one. The, the truth is this morning that there is mercy to be found. Here are these men. The Bible says that they're 10 lepers and they're standing at a distance as Jesus is entering town and they cry out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Now, why, why did they need mercy? Why did they need mercy shown to them? Because of the condition that they found themselves in. See, we have to almost go Doc Brown and Marty McFly and go back in time to figure some things out to make sense of it all. Because when you, when you understand leprosy and skin conditions in those days, when, when God gave Moses the law, in Leviticus chapter 13, when they're in the desert, God, God laid out the instructions for how they were to live. And he said, if anyone has a skin condition, so, so leprosy is kind of like this cover all term. It, it wasn't just leprosy as we understand leprosy today, but it was kind of any rash, any skin condition, any, any, any boils on the skin, anything somebody would look at you and, and maybe if you had eczema, that would be included under this, this condition. If, if you had this skin condition, you had to go show yourself to the priest. The priest would examine you. And, and upon examination, he would, he would require you to go outside of the camp and you had to quarantine for seven days. This was, this was COVID social distancing before COVID was even a thing. You had to go quarantine for seven days. At the end of that seven days, you'd come back to the priest, you'd take another test. <laughs> and if it was still positive or there was still something on your skin, you had to go outside of the town for, or outside the camp for another seven days. Until your skin was cured or healed and you would show yourself to the priest and the priest would look at it and say, okay, you're good. You can rejoin society. And so that's kind of the, the, the culture they were living in. So these men with this, this skin condition were, were cast out of society. It wasn't just a, a social banning, but it was a spiritual banning. They couldn't come to church. They couldn't worship. They couldn't present, present sacrifices or offerings if they were married. They couldn't see their wives if they had kids. They couldn't see their kids. They had to live outside of town and everywhere they went, they had to yell unclean, unclean. So that people that, that were walking around them would know I have to, to avoid this person so I don't get sick. I have to social distance, if you will, so that I don't get sick. There are some, some writings from around that time that, that say that if the wind was blowing hard on a particular day, that these, these leprous people would have to stay at least 150 feet away from anyone that happens to be downwind of them. Imagine that. Imagine your, your condition literally dictating every aspect of your life. You had to be aware of which way the wind was blowing so that you could make sure that there was nobody downwind of you so that you wouldn't pass off what you had onto them. They were dealing with this condition. And as Jesus is entering town from outside of town, they're saying, Lord, please have mercy on us. See, as they cry out, Jesus, he sees them. Jesus hears them and he extends mercy to them. I think for those of us that grew up in church, it's very easy for us to think of mercy only in terms of forgiveness of sins, right? Like, why do we need mercy? We need mercy because we're sinners, but that's not, that's not all encompassing of what mercy is. Mercy is so much more than that. Now, forgiveness, yes, is included in mercy. And because God is merciful, he forgives. But that's not where mercy ends. God's mercy is so much greater than we understand. Anytime you read scripture and you want to know what does this word mean or what does this idea mean, I would encourage you to, to go back and, and look at other times in scripture that that word is used. As we look at this word mercy, what, what does mercy mean? We find so many different people asking Jesus for mercy during his ministry. We look at Matthew chapter 17, and there's a man who has a son who's, who's uh, afflicted, and he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. This doesn't have to do with his forgiveness. He doesn't say, Lord, my son's a sinner. Please forgive him of his sins. He said, Lord, my, my son is possessed, and he's being tormented. Would you have mercy on him? Matthew chapter 20, we see two blind men, and like, like the lepers today, they cry out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Or Luke chapter 10, Jesus gives us the story of the good Samaritan. 
As the man was traveling, he was jumped and he was beaten up. He was left for dead. And a priest walked past him and a Levite walked past him. But the Samaritan looked and he, he picked him up, put him on his donkey, took him to the inn, paid his bill. Jesus gets to the end of the story and he says, I ask you, which one was a neighbor to this man? The answer was the one who showed him what? Mercy. See, it's not always just the forgiveness of sins, but mercy is so much bigger than that. And wherever you find yourself today, I want to encourage you and let you know that there is mercy to be found. So what is mercy? If you want to write it down, here's how I would define mercy. And those of you men that were at the July men's breakfast, this will probably be familiar to you because this is what we talked about. But mercy is the compassionate treatment of those in distress. That's what mercy is. In the distress of your sin, yes, Jesus and God in his mercy forgave you of those sins, paid the price. Why? Because he's merciful. But when you were in distress in your relationship and you cried out, Lord, have mercy. When you were were in distress in your mind and you couldn't control those racing thoughts and you cried out, Lord, have mercy. There is mercy to be found. Why? Because there's there's the, the, the compassionate, response to those who are in distress. Doesn't matter what your distress is. You can cry out and ask God for mercy. Now, how do we, how do we find mercy? How do we put ourselves in a position where God will be merciful to us? We memorized it this week. Blessed are who? The merciful for why? They shall be shown mercy. A lot of us want mercy, but we don't want to show mercy. A lot of us want to to receive mercy, but we don't want to extend mercy. A lot of us live with the Cobra Kai theology. Mercy is for the weak. We do not train to be merciful here. A man confronts you. He is the enemy. The enemy deserves no mercy. What is the problem, Mr. Lawrence? Come on. Sweep the leg. I'm not going to show mercy, but God, would you please have mercy on me? The compassionate treatment When you pull up to the light and you see the man standing on the side of the street with a sign, what do you do? Most of us, we have this this mercy meter internally. Does does this person deserve my compassion? Well, I don't know what he's going to do with this this money that I could give him. I don't know if he's going to go into the gas station and buy, I don't know if he's going to use it for food. And so because I distrust him, because I don't know him, I'm not going to have compassion on him. The person you pass on the street, I don't know them, so I'm not, I don't, I don't know that they really deserve mercy. I don't know that I should show them compassion, right? So many of us live lives that way. And listen, it's easy to understand because we, we hear stories about, you know, the, the, the podcast, Scamanda, this woman who started this blog, blogging her, her journey with cancer and her journey with treatment, and I, I can't afford it any, anymore. And so she starts this page, and people begin to donate hundreds of dollars. She raises $75,000 over that just to find out she never had cancer to begin with. She scammed people in their mercy, and because of compassion, they had sent resources to her. She, 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 didn't even, she didn't even struggle in that way. And so we hear stories about that. It's like, well, I just, I can't trust them. I don't know what they're going to do with it. But yet when I read this story, I don't see Jesus interviewing these 10 men saying, well, what are you going to do with my healing? What are you, what are you going to do? If, if I were to show mercy to you, what, what are you, how are you going to respond? In fact, I see him giving mercy to all of them, and yet, only one comes back. Jesus knew that. He knew that even, even, even with only one coming back, I will still extend mercy. Why? Because that's who God is. You want to talk about the nature of God? God is merciful. Even when you don't deserve it, he is merciful. Even when you can't earn it, he is merciful. In your distress, all you have to do is recognize it and call on, to, call, call on his name. Lord, please, would you have mercy on me? This morning, I don't know what your situation is, but I know that there is mercy to be found. There's mercy to be found, if you would, and God will respond with compassion. The second truth that I want to share with you is that your obedience will precede God's provision. 
oftentimes there are things in our lives that we know we ought to do. And there is a blessing that God is wanting to, to give us that, that requires our faith and our obedience to the known will of God. And then he meets our uh, obedience with his miraculous power and something, something great happens. They call out and say, God, have mercy on us. Master, have mercy on us. And, and what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, boom, you're healed. He doesn't go, skadoosh, you're healed. Come on, any Kung Fu Panda fans? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Skadoosh, imagine if Jesus did that, like, skadoosh, you're healed. He doesn't do that. What does Jesus say? He looked at them and he said, go show yourselves to the priest, they're at a distance because they can't come into town. Jesus is entering this village. Them at a distance, Lord, please, over here, it's us. Hey, will you have mercy on us? And Jesus looks at them and he, he says, go show yourselves to the priest. Could you imagine for them? Like, what's that gonna do? We, we asked you to show mercy. The priest isn't gonna have mercy. Just go show yourselves to the priest. But my situation hasn't changed. My skin is still jacked up. It's still obvious to people around. I'm still unclean. Go show yourselves to the priest. How many times in your life have you cried to God for mercy? And then you look around and it's like, but God, it's still the same. Right? You come to church and you... You hear a message and you leave encouraged. And it's like, God, I, I'm trusting in you. And by the time you get home, the devil's there to remind you that nothing's changed and everything's still the same. And so rather than walking in faith and walking in obedience to do what you know his word says to do, what do you do? You sit right back down. And maybe the, maybe the next teacher that comes through town will be able to, to heal me. Maybe if I just, maybe if I just go to, to the right healer, if I... If I get the right lotion, if I find the right ointment, if I get to the right treatment, then maybe this condition will take care of itself. Maybe if I just wait it out. How many times have you had to wait it out? Because God has extended you mercy, but you failed to walk in obedience. He says, go show yourselves to the priest. Right now? Yeah, right now. Nothing's changed. Do you trust me? The Bible says that as they went, go and put that scripture back out there. As they went, they were healed. As they went, as they responded in obedience, their healing came. It reminds me of a passage of scripture in John chapter two. Jesus' first recorded miracle, he's at a wedding. And as he's at this wedding, they, they run out of wine, which would have been a, a huge disgrace upon the, the groom. Like you, you just don't do that. So he ran out of wine and, and Mary, Jesus' mother, comes to him and says, Jesus, they ran, of wine, ran out of wine. And he says, that's none of my business. He says, my time hasn't come yet. And then she looks at the servants. She doesn't even reprimand him like, son. She didn't give him that mom look, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? She said, Jesus, they're out of wine. And Jesus is like, it's not my party. And then she looks at the servants and she just says, do whatever he tells you to do. And she walks away. I can see Jesus like, mom, <laughs> at 30 years old, mom. So he tells them, fill up the water jar, or fill up the jars with water. They, they, they should have been filled with wine, but he says, fill these jars with water. So they take them and jar after jar, they start filling these jars with water. And then Jesus tells them, now take some and go give it to the master of ceremonies. Give it to the head of the party, right? John chapter two, dip some out, take it to the master of ceremonies. Dip what out? The water that was in the jar. And I can see the servants like, it's water. Yeah, I know. We just filled these up with water. Yeah, I know. You want me to take some of this water? Yeah, dip some out. Okay, now what do you want me to do with it? Go serve it to that man. This water? Go serve it to him. And it says that as they, they poured it out, the master of ceremony, he took it and he took a drink and he says, this is the best wine I've had all day. You've saved the best for last. When did the water turn into wine? It wasn't when they put it in the jar. Can I tell you? It was probably when they poured it out. So Could you imagine the servants taking what he knows to be water 
and pouring it into the cup. (laughs) Had he left it in the jar, it probably would have stayed water. Had the lepers stayed outside the town, they probably would have remained leprous. It wasn't until they responded to God's word in obedience that God met them with his provision. The question we need to ask ourselves is what has God told us to do that we still haven't done? So many of us, the answer to our prayer is found in our obedience to his word. I knew at 14 years old that God had called me to ministry. Ran from it for eight years of my life. Found myself married with two kids working a job that I absolutely hated every single day. And it wasn't even about the employer and it wasn't about the job. It just, it wasn't what God created me for. Like there were people there that loved that job and thrived in that job. And I looked at them every day like, why are you so happy to come here? Like, honestly, had I gone to somebody, they probably would have diagnosed me as having like this deep depression. Just there was no meaning and purpose in my life and was struggling in it to the point where like I hated going to work, got myself fired. And I remember walking out with a a box of things that I had accumulated in my four or five years that I had worked there. And I'm walking out to my car thinking I have to tell Angel. We've got two kids. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it was just a few months later that dad sat down with me at a a restaurant and said, I feel like God wants me to plant a church. And my response in that moment was, "Whatever, whatever I can do to help, let me know. One thing led to another. I didn't anticipate that this is what it would look like 13 years later. But it wasn't until I submitted myself to the known will of God It wasn't until I stopped running and I became obedient that then the the meaning and the purpose, the depression would, would go away. Why? Because I knew what God wanted me to do, but instead of doing it, I ran from it. Some of you, you've been praying for things and saying, God, would you have mercy on me? But you're you're not being obedient to what God has told you to do. I love to hunt. Dad loves to hunt. For those of you that that like to hunt, any hunters in here, deer hunters? Anybody like to deer hunt? Okay, like three of you. We're going to have to work on that. Lord, bring us more hunters (laughs) with lots of land that they'll let me hunt. Yes, Lord. Those of you that like to deer hunt, I I like to rifle hunt. Rifle hunting is fun, but rifle hunting to me is kind of cheating because you can sit at 300 yards and you can reach out and you can smack a deer and as soon as you hit them, typically nine times out of 10, they drop right there. I prefer hunting how my ancestors used to hunt. <laughs> Bow and arrow, right? The thing about archery hunting is you have to get, you have to get close. The thing about archery hunting is you have to, to be accurate. When you shoot you know, with a rifle, it, it hits them like a train. And it really doesn't matter where you, that deer is going to go down. As long as you hit it with an arrow, you have to be precise. And, and so you, 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 Sitting in your tree, this animal comes walking by, you take your shot. And it's not like rival, because with rival, it's like boom. With archery, it's like. And you see them run off, and it's like, hopefully I can find it. Now the work begins, and you get out of your tree, and you get down, and you start looking for, start looking for blood. And for those of you that are like, oh my gosh, don't talk about Bambi's mom that way. Just bear with me for a few minutes. You get down in the, the, way that, the way that you ensure that you harvest that animal is you get down and you look for this blood trail and you find where it last was and you find your arrow and, you, you, you find, and then you follow which way it went and there's blood there and there's blood there and there's blood there. And it helps if you have more than one person because there's, there's times where, where there's a nice trail. There's times where you'll be following blood and then you look up and the deer's right there, right? <laughs> right? And then there's also times where you see blood and then you can't see anything else. And so one person will stay where the last known blood was, last place you saw a sign, and then you'll go and you'll examine just like a a three foot by three foot area. 
You'll look at every leaf and you'll look at every rock and you'll look at every stick, just looking for some kind of sign. And then if you, if you find, sometimes it's just like the size of a, a pin. Like, okay, I got some. They'll come here and then you'll, you'll continue on. And you're looking for sign. Sometimes you'll find it. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes, you know, you're walking through the woods and, and you're, you're walking through trees and you're walking under branches and you, you get to a point where it's like, I can't see anything. There's a trail this way and there's a trail this way and there's water down there and it could have gone any direction. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Have you ever not known what to do in your life? Yeah. I don't know which way to go. I don't know what decision to make. There's three different choices right now, and, and really, it could be anywhere. When you're tracking a deer in that situation, what you need to do is go back to the last place you saw blood. The last place you knew you were right. Because here, I know I'm right. I know what to do from here. Now I can go look this way. And if I don't see anything, I can come back, and I can go look this way. And if I don't see anything, I can come back. Listen, it works the same way in your life. Some of you are out here in the darkness wondering, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what job to take. I don't know if this relationship is right. I don't know how, how I'm gonna pay all the bills. I don't know what's going on. I'm getting so frustrated and I can't see a way out. I've looked under every rock and I've uncovered every leaf and I can't see anything. God, I don't know what to do. Go back to the last thing that God told you to do and do that thing. So many times we, we get so far ahead of ourselves. Even in track, right? We, we get so far and it's like, we get so excited and it's like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be great. And the next thing you know, it's like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm at. I don't know what to do now. In our lives, we can get to that point. But listen, you need to understand, it's all about obedience to the known word of God, to the known will of God. God's never gonna hold you accountable for doing the mysteries that he hasn't revealed to you yet. Like there's so much that I don't understand. Yeah, me too. But he's revealed some things to you and all he's asking of you is to do what you know to do. God, I need mercy. Okay, then stop living with your boyfriend. Well, isn't there another trail I can follow? God, this sin in my life, God, I need mercy. God says, are you being obedient to what you know to do? God, my, my bills are piling up. Are you being generous in a way that you know will please me? Are you bringing the tithe? Are you doing what you know you should do? Well, no. Okay, then go back to that last thing and be obedient. And as you're obedient in that, he'll show you the next step. And then he'll show you the next step. And you can look back and see, okay, God, you led me from there and you led me from here. And, and now, Holy Spirit, would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would your word be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? And now you'll find yourself walking in the, the favor of God. Why? Because your obedience precedes his provision. They were obedient. Go show yourself to the priest. The third, the third truth that I want to share with you is that the only response to God's mercy, the only, the only acceptable response to God's mercy is gratitude. It's gratitude. It says that on their way, they saw that they were healed and one man came back. Go and put that scripture up. When he saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. Are you grateful for the mercy that's been extended to you? Not thankful, but grateful. See, gratitude is not an emotion. Sometimes, you know, it's like we, we encounter God's mercy and it's like, thanks, Jesus. That's not gratitude. That's thankfulness. Gratitude is your expression of that thankfulness. Gratitude is the way you live your life in light of God's mercy. 
Gratitude is how you honor him and glorify him because of what he's done for you. See, this man came back and Jesus said, did, did only one come back to give God glory? The purpose of his mercy is to return you to his feet to glorify him. You were created to glorify God. And as he extends mercy in your distress, are you like the nine who went about their lives or are you the one who comes back to glorify God? I think a lot of us, if we were honest in our evaluation, could, could understand and, and sympathize more with the nine than with the one. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Who knows when the last time they had hugged their spouse was? Who knows when the last time they were able to, to be with their kids? Imagine, imagine having to stay 150 feet away from your loved ones and, hi, how's school going? I miss you. I wish I could hug you. Is everything good? Are you, are you taken care of? Are you, are you eating well? You're growing so fast. Yet they were, they were outcast. They were, they were isolated. And here they encounter mercy from Jesus. And he says, go show yourself on the way. All of them, they, they were healed. But nine of them were so anxious. And you can't blame them to get back to life how it was. Nine of them said, thank you, Jesus. Now I can go back to doing what I want to do. Only one of them said, thank you, but had a heart of gratitude to return to Jesus and to give him the glory. So many times in our lives, like, God, have mercy on me. And he meets the need and he brings the provision. We're like, okay, thanks. I'm going to go back to doing what got me here in the first place. God, I'm in distress relationally. God, my marriage is in distress. Would you extend mercy? And he does. And then rather than changing our mind and our actions and our attitudes, we continue in the same patterns of behavior that got us into distress in the first place. Why? Because we're thankful, but there's no gratitude. There's no outward expression of what God has done. The only response to God's mercy is gratitude. Gratitude is the expression of your appreciation. And then number four, the fourth truth is this. There is mercy to be found. Some of you are like, that's the same as number one. Some of you are like, I didn't even know that because I wasn't taking notes. Number one, there is mercy to be found. Number four, there is mercy to be found. Well, it's the same thing. We already talked about this, did we? There's two different things that I want to point out to you. Because when we encounter these men, they cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, Master, have mercy on us. They go and they were healed. And then at the end of the story, this man who comes back, Jesus says to him, stand up, go, your faith has healed you. I thought he was already healed, right? Like on his way, they saw that they were healed. When they, when they were obedient to the word of God, they, they were healed. And so we, we see now at the end of the story, it says your faith has healed you. Is it the same healing? I would say, no, it's not. Why? Because there's two different words used. The first one, the first Greek word used is, you know, when, when it says that the man seeing that he was healed literally means to be cured of a sickness. So the first time in this passage we see that he's healed, the the word, the idea surrounding that is he recognizes that his physical ailment has been cured. I've been, I've been healed. I've been made well physically. Now at the end of this story, after responding to God's mercy and worship and glorifying God, responding in gratitude, Jesus tells him, go, your faith has healed you. And that Greek word is different than the first word. This Greek word is the Greek word sozo, which more often is translated as saved you. It's the same word that and when Jesus tells the rich man, go and sell everything that you have and give to the needy and then come and follow me. The rich man went away sad because he had a lot of wealth. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. 
to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples asked this question, if, if, if rich people can't be saved, who then can be saved? It's that same word, sozo. Who then can be made whole? Jesus tells them, your faith has made you whole. See, 10 men that day found outward healing. They found relief from their ailment. But only one of them found the eternal hope that comes through faith in Jesus. 10 men were healed physically. God's grace was extended to all 10, but only one found true wholeness. I don't think it's coincidence that these men were lepers in this story because it's communicating a truth to us. The Bible often uses pictures of different things and, and leprosy is, is a picture of sin in our lives. Maybe you're here today and your leprosy is not some skin condition on the outside, but maybe your leprosy is, is a condition of the heart. See, because of the leprosy, they were, they were isolated. Has your sin ever isolated you from community? Has your sin ever caused you to walk around knowing you were unclean? Maybe it's not on the outside where you have to walk around and let people know, hey, I got this disease. But maybe when Pastor Angel gets up and says, hey, you should join a small group. Your inner leprosy is saying, I can't do that because then they'll see how messed up I am. I can't get close to people because then they'll see how dark my heart really is. I, I can't do that because I'm so unclean. Because of their leprosy, their relationships were fractured. Has sin ever, ever gotten in the way of a relationship in your life? Has sin ever tried to put its foot between you and your spouse? Has the sin of unforgiveness broken relationships in your family? See, leprosy is, is a picture of the spiritual leprosy that we all find ourselves with today. It isolates, it, it breaks relationship. It causes us to walk around and all we can, can think about, we have to lead with our sin. We have to lead with our pain. We have to, to lead with our addiction. This is just who I am. But I'm thankful that there's a priest that we can go and show ourselves to. Thankful that there's a priest that doesn't just look at our condition, but is able to do something about our condition. I'm thankful that Hebrews chapter four talks about that. He says, says we, don't, we don't serve a priest who doesn't empathize with us or understand, but he was tempted in every way that we're tempted and yet he did not sin. And so because of that, let us go boldly to the throne of God. There we will receive his mercy. There we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Today, I don't, I don't know where you're at. Maybe... Maybe the distress you find yourself in is an outward situation. Maybe there's something going on in your life and you just need God to respond compassionately on your behalf in your distress. The good news is there's mercy to be found. Maybe you're here today and you think about those lepers and, and what it required of them and the situation condition they found themselves in. Maybe you, maybe you empathize with that because it's not an outward thing, but inwardly you know you're unclean. Inwardly, you're self-isolating. Inwardly, you're, you're closing yourself off from community. The good news is that Jesus died. He shed his blood so that your sins could be forgiven. And if you would call upon his name and you would turn to his throne, that there is mercy to be found. And this morning, as we dismiss, I just wanna pray for you. I wanna pray with you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor John, I need mercy. I'm in distress relationally, financially, emotionally. There's a situation, maybe it's a, a diagnosis, it's a sickness in your body and you need God's mercy to be shown on your behalf. If that's you and you say, something's going on in my life, I need God's mercy. Would you do me a favor and just raise your hand right where you're at? Man, hands all over the place. You can put your hand down. If you're here today and you say, you know what, it's not so much an outward thing, it's, but today I, I empathize with those lepers because there's, there's this leprosy of sin in my heart. I feel isolated. I feel, I feel cut off. I feel unclean. 
Every time I go into God's presence, I know that it's not right. I know that I'm not right. And I need God in his mercy to forgive me, to wash me, to cleanse me, to make me brand new, to take off those rags of my old nature and to clothe me instead with his righteousness. If you're here today and you know that it's not the outside, but it's the inside that needs cleaning, would you, would you just raise your hand and say, I need to find mercy today? Hands all over the place. A lot of people need mercy. Listen, it's part of being human. We all need mercy. The good news is his mercy is new every day. And if you would wake up tomorrow and say, God, I need your mercy, guess what he meets you with? Mercy. You wake up tomorrow and say, God, help me. You know what he meets you with? He meets you with grace to help you when you need it. This morning, would you do me a favor? Would you just stand with me? I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to be dismissed this morning. But there were hands all over the place. God, I pray today as we call upon you, even as these men seeing you at a distance said, Jesus, Master, Lord, may we not look to you just to be our Savior, just to be, just be the one that fixes our situation. But Lord, may we, may we align our will with yours. May we be those that are obedient to your word so that through our obedience and your provision that you would be glorified in and through us. Lord, for those that, that have raised their hand and said, I'm in distress. I've got a situation, got a circumstance that I'm going through and I just need God to be compassionate on my behalf. Lord, I pray that you would respond with compassion that you would see the cries, that you would hear the cries of your people. Even as you said to Moses from the burning bush, I've heard the cries of my people and I'm gonna deliver them. Lord, would you bring deliverance to your people today in our situations? God, as we look to you and as we align our lives with your word, Lord, I pray that you would be compassionate on your people. Lord, for those that were bold enough and courageous enough to say, you know what, my, my sin is on the inside. My leprosy is on the inside. I need mercy on the inside. Lord, I, I thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin when we confess them to you. And so Lord, today we confess we are sinners in need of a savior. Would you wash us? Would you cleanse us? It's by your blood, through your mercy and by your grace. And Lord, today we place our faith in you. We place our trust in you. And pray that you would, you would look upon us with mercy, forgiving our sin, casting it as far as the east is from the west and leading us in this new life. Even as first Peter, we, we said it earlier, but it's because of your great mercy that you have made new life available to us. Thank you that we can be born again in you and through you. And Holy Spirit, would you change us and transform us from the inside out? Give us the mind of Christ. Give us the heart of Christ that we would be obedient to the known word of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless you, church. Love you guys. Have a good week. At Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping each other do three things. Discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. Please check out our past sermon series or online discipleship classes. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the bell for notifications on all of our latest videos.